Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Fish in the West. I'm your host, John B. And today I'm going to be counting down from the five most strange species, fish species, located here in the United States. Now, all these fish species are native to U.S. water. Some of them are saltwater. And some of them aren't just specific species. Some of them are actually a type of fish under a certain category. So what I'm going to do in this counting down, counting down from the uh, top five and give you my opinion on the top five strangest, most unique fish that we have here in, uh, in the States. And some of these you may have never even heard before, some of these you may never even knew existed, but I found these to be quite interesting. And then, you know, the ice fishing here is really slow, and I haven't been able to go out in the fox recently, so I haven't been able to make a whole lot of active videos of me fishing, so I thought I'd film this today. And I think this is almost just as cool as me just talking about a certain reviewer reviewing a reel. But I wanted to bring this to you guys because this is some new stuff I've never even heard of until recently. So uh, thanks for watching and stay tuned. Now this first species I want to talk about really grabbed my attention, really interests me. Partially because the storyline and how this species was created, so to speak, is very, very kind of creepy and almost in a sense that that it sounds kind of like a failed scientific experiment. Now back in the 1960s there was a fish and wildlife management professor who was experimenting with different breeds of fish. His name was William Childers and what he was doing is he was taking different game fish including bluegill, crappie, largemouth small, spotted bass and breeding them together. Um, he was trying to create a hybrid species that he could stock and he could uh, provide for the DNR to stock in local lakes so they could attract um, anglers from all around and uh, attract more traffic to, so to speak, some, for some of these lakes. Now, most of Childers' experiments failed and a lot of the offspring of some of these hybrid mixes between crappie, bluegill, and crappie and bass did not survive, but there was one that was actually viable for weeks on uh, on fourth, and actually survived up until to get actually to a very very large size, and that being two combinations of three different fish. What it is is it's a cross between a male smallmouth and a fe female spotted bass, or a male smallmouth and a female largemouth. Now at first thought, this sounds like a genius idea. You're taking some of the three most popular game fish and you're breeding them together to create an ultimate, you know, just this really strong fighting fish. And at first thought, it seems like a great idea. Now, when William figured out that this was a viable offspring and he was able to actually grow these things and they were actually able to reproduce on their own, he started to experiment with stocking them stocking with them and coexisting them with different species of largemouth, smallmouth, and spotted bass. Now what he found after observing some of the stockings, previous stockings, was that the smaller mean mouth, is what they call the mean mouth bass, were chasing the larger female smallmouth and female largemouth and actually putting them to the point where it would cease spawning. So some of these fish, smallmouth and largemouth, were ceasing to spawn when they had fish uh, such as the mean mouth coexisting with them. So these fish were extremely aggressive and were also even known to, on some reports, to even chase dogs out of the water. These fish were fearless. They had no mercy and they liked to run in packs just like smallmouth, but were as aggressive as spotted bass, smallmouth, and largemouth. It's really crazy if you think about it. And it's a shame that these fish can't cooperatively coexist with some of the other species. Now, the problem with this is these fish are too aggressive. They can't be together with your native species and your favorite lake or anything like that. And while they may be one of the hardest fighting breeds of largemouth small or spotted bass, you probably won't see them anytime soon in your local lake, stream, pond, river, um, or any body of water reservoir anytime soon. Um, after this experiment in the 1960s, and after having some of these fish being stocked in some of the mid Midwestern areas, 
um, all stocking was cut off because of the fact that these fish were actually wiping out um, most of the uh, most of the population in uh, some of these ponds, and they weren't necessarily wiping them out, but they were competing to the point where um, extinction of a, a certain species in a body of water was at risk. Um, now, while some of these species still naturally occur in our waterways today, there are absolutely no known stockings in the U.S. of these mean mouth fish. Your hayline can be kind of misunderstood as a fish being able to survive in brackish water. And what brackish water is, is a mixture between salt water and fresh water where salt water and fresh water species can coexist and live together in a natural environment. And a lot of Florida anglers experience this every day when they're fishing on the canals. Sometimes, you know, they'll get a random tarpon out of nowhere or a snook while they're bass fishing. And if you think about it, that's kind of cool. It's something that us Midwestern anglers don't get to experience every day is, uh, you know, throwing a spook out there, catching a few two-pound bass, and all of a sudden a huge tarpon comes up and wails at it. To me, that's pretty interesting, pretty cool. Now, while brackish water seems kind of cool and brackish water fish seems kind of cool, the Uri A-Line species of fish seems even neater to me. And what that is, is it's, it's a fish that can survive in salt water and or fresh water. So they kind of have the option between two different types of water. And kind of thinking about that, it's almost like the ultimate fish, you know, this thing is, you know, these species are almost indestructible in the sense that, you know, you can put them in just about any type of water, cold, warm, salt water, fresh water, and they're going to survive most of the time. And a few of these species that, you know, people know right off the top of their head are trout, salmon, herring, shad. But there are a few that are undermined and some that are kind of underestimated. Well, the one, first off, is the tilapia. I had always thought tilapia was a brackish water fish and mainly a freshwater fish. But I, supposedly a tilapia can survive in salt water or freshwater, which is kind of cool to me considering I totally, you know, thought it was just exclusively freshwater or brackish water. The next one is the pufferfish. And I had always thought that that guy was, uh, you know, all the way in and all the way over here on the saltwater side, but I guess they can survive in some freshwater environments. Uh, another one that actually really surprised me was the lamprey eel. The lamprey eel I always thought was uh, freshwater and thrived in you know, freshwater rivers, but I guess um, some of the mouths of the rivers have pushed them towards more of the saltwater side, so you kind of get an even side with that. And one of the ones that totally shocked me was sturgeon. I guess sturgeon can somehow survive in saltwater um, I always knew they could survive in fresh water, but I guess they can survive in salt water as well. Um, and if some of you guys don't believe me, I'll post some of the links below and where I found this. It's all credible sources. Um, I just find that to be totally awesome, is that these fish can survive in two completely different environments and uh, makeups of water. Now number three on my list is something you guys may have heard of, and if you do a lot of ice fishing in Minnesota and some of the northern states, you've most likely heard of this species. Now a lot of you guys who don't do some ice fishing and are from the western or southern parts of uh, the United States, this may be new to you. And this species is the eel pout, um, also known as the burbot. And what this is, is it kind of looks like a cross between a catfish, a cod, and an eel. It's a very weird, creepy looking fish and uh, is quite common actually in uh, Minnesota and some of the northern states. Now a couple cool things about the eel pellet that I found to be, I don't know, somewhat out of the ordinary is that they only spawn in cold water, meaning that they actually spawn under the ice. Now you've heard of fish starting to spawn and beginning to spawn um, in some of the cold days in March where there's still, you know, some layer of ice up there, but these fish go full on spawn in January and February. Now the fact that they spawn under the ice makes them a very popular uh, ice fishing fish. Now some people don't like to catch these fish and it can be actually common to catch these fish through the ice but supposedly they fight very hard through the ice and uh, there's actually festivals held for these fish um, on lakes for ice fishing and uh, they're a pretty well-known fish but I think that they're kind of cool in a sense that you know they spawn in an unorthodox way that most fish spawn in. Um, and I find that to be very intriguing and that's kind of reason why I put it on my number three list of fish that you probably hadn't, haven't heard of. If you're interested in fishing for some eel pout, there is a festival every year in February that's called the International Eel Pout Festival on Leech Lake. And um, 
it's just like a big congregation of people getting together, um, catching bourbon and yop out, and uh, it's just it sounds like a great time. Actually, it makes me want to go and uh, go and check out the festival myself. But if you're interested in doing that, go to Leech Lake. They have it every year around February. And uh, apparently that's where you can catch some good eel pout and uh, meet up with some guys who know what they're doing. But the reason why I chose it is it's got a very thick and interesting background and history to it. That species being the bofin. They are native to the United States and North America. These fish are said to be, again, one of the most hard-fighting uh, North American species for their size um, in the Midwestern area. Now, I've actually come across a few bowfin in my lifetime, but never have caught one, and I've heard of people saying that these fish fight pound for pound. Now, they don't get very big, and they don't get to sizes where, you know, it's a, you know, it's a trophy bowfin, but uh, they average around about two to three pounds, which is a decent size, and they fight very hard. So anything over that is kind of considered a trophy, but it's somewhat uncommon. These fish date back to relatives that existed in the Jurassic period. You know, hundreds of thousands of years ago, these fish are ancient ancestors, um, or closely related to the ancient ancestors of, you know, what the fish were like hundreds of thousands of years ago. And to me, that's absolutely fascinating. And these fish almost do look prehistoric. They are very toothy, they've got very hard heads, and they just don't look like a normal North American fish, but are actually somewhat common here in the Midwest and uh, lakes around the uh, United States. These fish supposedly fight pound for pound and can be some of the most aggressive fish in the United States for their size. Now, while a salmon or a trout may fight harder than this, they only get to about two to three pounds on average and are said to fight almost harder or as hard as an eight pound to six pound smallmouth or largemouth bass. I also think that's kind of cool. You know, they're, they're kind of hard to catch. Um, they're pretty elusive. They're also known as the, the lone wolf of the water since they don't really run in packs or schools and you usually see them lurking through grass or pads. Um, but they can be somewhat hard to catch. If, uh, if you're targeting them specifically. They're not like snakeheads that are very prominent in the, uh, in, in the Florida area and the uh, southern area. Unfortunately, a lot of people have mistaken these guys as being snakeheads, and um, sometimes, but not often, uh, people will actually throw them on land or um, dispose of them uh, because they think that they're non-native and invasive species. So they kind of get a bad rep for them, but they are completely native and maybe some of the oldest fish and oldest um, related fish to some of our uh, original ancestors here in North America. So they almost have kind of the ground rights to some of our lakes and unfortunately some people who don't know what how to identify between the two species between a snakehead and a bowfin end up killing them, which is, which is kind of sad. Like the snakehead, they can survive for some time out of the water and there's actually been some, some cases of farmers plowing their fields and plowing up uh, some of these bowfin that are encased in a fluid filled sack uh, under the mud or under the uh, wet dirt. And uh, it's actually become, I don't know if it still is today, but what I've read is back in the day it was actually some of their caviar was used by farmers as, as somewhat, say, as a delicacy. Um, so, you know, people would be plowing and all of a sudden they plow a fish in the middle of the field, and I can't imagine how crazy that would be. The very last species I'm going to talk about today is a species you actually cannot catch. And the actual size of this fish is only about an inch long. And you may be wondering why am I discussing a fish that is unimportant to the game fish uh, world and the angling world. Now the reason because is it may be one of our oldest fish in the United States. Or maybe related to some of the oldest fish in the United States. This fish is the pupfish, the Nevada pupfish or the devil's hole pupfish which is native to only a very small portion of the United States. Now this fish inhabits one of the smallest known habitats to any invertebrate in the entire world. So no other invertebrate has a smaller home than the pupfish. This pupfish lives in a 10 by 50 square foot range that is 400 feet deep. The thing is, is the pupfish can only survive in about the 80 foot column because Devil's Hole, which is located in Devil's Valley, is one of the lowest 
sea level points in the United States, which is about 280 feet. And any lower than that is too much pressure for the pupfish to survive in and is too deep, just in general, for any, uh, for most freshwater species to survive in. Now the interesting thing about this is there's only about 65 or less of these pupfish alive today. And they can survive in water temps ranging from 93 or higher. Now that's 93 degrees Fahrenheit, which is extremely hot and for most anglers out there who know that bass almost don't even move in anything that's uh, higher than 90 or even lower than that. So it's kind of sad that these fish are on the near extinction. They live in a habitat that is almost 1.7 billion years old. So this fish could be closely related to some of our oldest United States fish. Now the reason why this guy makes number one on the list is partially because he's got such a tough life, you know. These little pupfish have very little room to live in. They live in such a high climate area, 93 degrees and higher, and they're on the brink of this extinction. So to me, these guys deserve the top spot in some of the top uh, five most strangest, weirdest species here in the United States and North America. And I, to me, I think it's one of the most uh, craziest things and craziest fish I ever heard of. Thanks for watching, and if you guys want to check out some more information on some of these fish and species, I've left some of the uh, citations below where you can check some out. Thanks for watching. Let me know how you like these uh, this format of video. I know I haven't been able to do a whole lot of ice fishing videos. Ice fishing has been very poor around here, like I said before. So uh, let me know what you guys think, and if you guys want to see some more of this type and format of video, not necessarily the same countdown, or just talking about some different things rather than just straight up fishing. Thanks for watching, and I'll catch you guys next time on Fishing the Midwest.